All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for Navigating in Space. Solar System Ambassador David S. Ball, who's a volunteer educator with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, will discuss navigation in space. Determining where we are and how to get places has been an age-old challenge on land. This was comp compounded as humans took to the sea and into the air. And the next great challenge, Ball will discuss how we find our way in outer space. So David uh, has served 26 years in the US Air Force and he retired as a Lieutenant Colonel. So uh, for all uh, 50 of us or so who are watching live and the many more that will watch the recording, <laughs> let's thank David for his service and let's give David a big virtual round of applause for being with us today. Uh, David, you can take it away. Oh, super. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Um, I'm I'm so grateful to, to the Tewksbury Library. I mean, you, you're you able to reach so many people and, and so much more than we could possibly do uh, in person. And it's an opportunity to to share interests and, and to be able to talk about things of it, uh, of uh, um, things that we're curious about. And, and so what I wanted to talk about today, let me uh, let me share my screen here. is I wanted to, I was thinking a little bit about how we navigate in space. And uh, I just, uh, it, it it's interesting to me. And, and it's, it's not only had an impact on, uh, on how astronauts get places, but, but it's had an impact on us in a broader society. So, so let's talk a little bit about navigation in space. So when you think about getting from one place to another, uh, let's start out with walking. So you're you're standing in one place. You want to go to someplace else. Um, you know maybe you have a compass and and you you go in that direction, or 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 you have a map and and you're making lefts and rights and you you uh, you get to where you want to go. And and so the the walking you know fa fairly simple. We've we've been doing that for a while. Same thing with with driving. You know, maybe it's a little bit different because um, you maybe can't get there from here because it's a one-way street or because you're going a lot faster or, you know, so there are some little things that are a little bit different about driving places than walking. Uh, and then once we took to the ocean, uh, maybe there are some different challenges there. I mean, the, uh, about which way the wind's blowing or whether there are currents or, uh, you know, some different things about navigating when you're at sea. And then when we look at navigating in the air, different complexities, different challenges, different opportunities. And uh, and then when we're talking about space. So starting with um, starting with with at sea, I, I read an interesting book by Dana Sobel uh, called Longitude. And in it, they talk about uh, one of the big challenges of navigation, uh, in the 18th century. So over here, we have a map of uh, the west coast of Africa, and you can see the incredible amount of detail of all of the, the inlets and rivers associated with the west coast of Africa, because that's where the ships were able to figure out exactly where they were, so they're able to map it. And you can see these lines where, okay, so somebody has a compass and you say, well, okay, I, I know where I am and I'm, I'm kind of headed in this direction. And, and so that's the, that's the state of the art for, uh, uh, for navigating at sea. So there are some challenges when you're navigating on the water. So waves, wind, war, weather, all these things have some different kinds of, of, um, of challenges. So different from from being like along the coast, you you know you're you're sailing along and there's the coast to the right. You know you could you could do that. That's basically a straight line. But if you're in the open ocean, uh, you have to do things by dead reckoning. You have to uh, estimate you know where your position is because you you know you're in the middle of a big ocean. You can't tell exactly where you are. And sometimes the charts aren't very good. And there's a question of instrument accuracy. Um, so uh, let's let's look at how it is that we were able to navigate uh, at sea. So it turns out that if you have something called a sextant, here we've got this right here, 
and you're able to measure the angle between the sun when it's at its highest, so you know at, at noon, and uh, and the horizon, you can determine how far away you are from the equator. You can say, well, I'm 10 degrees higher than the equator, and this is our latitude, okay? Um, and it goes from zero at the equator and it goes to 90, which is the North Pole or, or 90 South, the South Pole. So navigators at sea, all they had to do was figure out when the, the sun was at its highest, take the angle, and they'd figure out, you know, how high they were up on the globe. Now, east-west, understanding the longitude, different story. And really what would be super useful is if you had, if you were able to have a clock that told you what the time is at a reference place. So let's say Greenwich, England, and you could take that clock with you on your voyage, you could figure out where you were in east to west, so the, the longitude. So in 1720, this is about the time that the Admiralty in, uh, in Great Britain, which was a great sea power, um, kind of put out the challenge and said, we need to solve this problem. We need to understand navigation, east-west navigation at sea. So this thing over here on the left, <clears throat> this grandfather's clock, this is a clock that was made in 1720, all right? So it's a it's made of dissimilar, dissimilar metals. It's a big wooden thing. It's got this long pendulum. Uh, you can imagine, you put this on a ship and uh, it's exposed to extremes in humidity and temperature and uh, you know the, the boat is rocking and it's getting wet and all this kind of stuff. So this is, it's impractical. You know, it, it's not going to tell uh, a reasonable amount of time. So uh, John Harrison, who was working at this time on clots, he made it kind of his life mission that he was going to create a, uh, uh, a clock that you could take on the ship. All right, so this, this one here, this is H1, this thing here is H2, this is H3, and this is H5. And by, by, by H5, it, it looks like a pocket watch, right? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's sealed against the elements, and, um, and many of his, his timepieces didn't have any lubricants, and they were incredibly accurate. So what we're talking about is, uh, is, is a chronograph, uh, a, a chronometer. And here you can see in a box, a one uh, that, that was uh, uh, used. And they, they would set these things when they were leaving on their voyage to, uh, to, to the time in England. And they were able to compute um, where they were on an east to west basis. So now let's look at if we were flying. Okay, well, there are <clears throat> challenges to air navigation. So, you know, if you're trying to fix where you are, let's say you're flying out over the water or you're flying over the water at night or in poor weather, uh, be quite difficult to figure out where you were, right? And you know, if you wanted to use like uh, celestial navigation, you're trying to use the stars to try to figure out where you're at and you're a, you know, a solo pilot and, and the, the, you're in an open cockpit and the wind's coming at you at a hundred miles an hour and it's freezing and you're trying to you know, shoot pictures of the stars and it's cloudy. You could imagine there are some real problems in and and the airplane's going fast and it's it's rolling all over the place so you can imagine there are all kinds of challenges associated with trying to do navigation in the air so here are a couple of ideas of how you can do it with with airplanes so the first one is called pilotage and so what that means is okay you're in your airplane and you're flying along and you look down and you see railroad tracks so if you follow those railroad tracks you're going to get to wherever it is that those railroad tracks go. That's pilotage, all right? Um, but let's say, for example, look at the, the one below pilotage. Let's say you're going from Phoenix and you wanna to go to El Paso, but you don't have railroad tracks that go between there. And, and, and by the way, uh, one of the jokes with pilots uh, is they say, do you know what IFR stands for? So IFR means instrument flight rules. That's when you, you use your instruments to figure out how to get places as opposed to pilotage. But um, IFR, they say that means I follow roads. So if, you know, if there was a road going there, you'd be able to figure that out. But it, it, underneath the one that says pilotage, and we're going from Phoenix, we're going to El Paso, 
and it turns out that there isn't a railroad track that goes there. You could um, say, well, okay, I've got a compass and El Paso is, in, is this in this direction and uh, my airplane flies at a certain speed and I've got this much crosswind and I know there are certain landmarks that I'm gonna see as I'm flying. So for example, I know that I'm gonna fly over this river or I'm gonna be able to, when I get to the river, I look to my left, there's gonna be a reservoir. So you could figure out, you could say, okay, I'm starting in Phoenix, I'm going in this direction, I'm going at this speed, there's this much crosswind. Um, and after 23 minutes, all of a sudden you reach the river and there's the reservoir and you've got this new fix, you know, this, I know where I'm at right at this second. So this is called deductive reckoning or they call it dead reckoning. And it's a way of getting places if you don't have a railroad track that takes you there. So dead reckoning, that's something that, that all pilots learn to do. Uh, and then there are uh, electronic things that, that can be done in addition to pilotage and dead reckoning. So there's one called flying the beam. So you could have a, a, a radio compass where, where you've got a, a transmitter that's at an airport and it sends out Morse code. So when it's sending out this Morse, Morse code, if it uh, if, if the the signal that you get comes back and and the Morse code is saying a a a a, what it's telling you is that the signal is to your left and you need to turn left. Now, if you're flying along and it keeps saying n n n n, what it's saying is that the beam is to your right. You need to turn right. And what, what, what they say is that if you're if you're in the right place, the N and the A cancel it, it, it out and you get this tone. And, and they call that flying the beam. So in the 1920s and 30s, that's a way that you could get places, that you, that you, could, you could tune into this and you'd be hearing the A or you'd be hearing the N and that would kind of, you know, that would get you there. And there are, uh, there are radio uh, compasses and uh, down here in the lower left, we've got a guy who's um, who's using a sextant, right? But he's using a sextant uh, for the stars uh, and he's doing it from an airplane. Now, you couldn't really do this if you're uh, a barnstormer in a, in a biplane, but imagine that you're uh, in a, a B-29 and you're flying across the Pacific and uh, you know it's at night and you know all you have down there is water, you don't have pilotage. Dead, dead reckoning can be kind of uh, can be kind of dicey, and you got a crew of twelve. So you might have a guy who's a navigator, and he kind of goes up there and figures out where the stars are and the angles and things like that. G gets an idea whether or not they're on track. Uh, and then down here, you can see with this helicopter, they're taking all kinds of measurements that are coming from uh, satellites. And so what a satellite is doing is it's spinning around the Earth. And it has a very precise clock in it. And it's able to do a bunch of triangulation with ground stations and figure out exactly where it is. And it's sending that signal to your GPS receiver and telling you where you are. So now with GPS, and we have this, you know, not just in airplanes, but you have it in your car, you have it on your telephone. Um, you're able to tell pretty darn close, you know, where you are in the world based on having three, four, five different satellites sending information saying, well, this is the angle, this is where this satellite is, and this is where you, you are. But how about when we're talking not about walking in a straight line or uh, driving a car or being you know, at sea or, or in an airplane, now let's say we wanna uh, fly in outer space. Well, different kinds of challenges, right? Because not only do you have the motion of the spacecraft, which might be going, you know, thousands of miles an hour, but you've got all these pieces moving, right? When, when you're on the Earth, even though the Earth is moving, everything's moving at the same rate, right? So um, that's not really an issue. But if you're in space, you know, the, the moon is moving at one, one speed and the earth at a different speed and they're going in different directions. And, you know, you've got all these things interacting. So you've got this motion and then the distances are just tremendous, right? And, it, you know, unlike in pilotage or dead reckoning, um, you don't, when, when we're going from here to the moon, there's like nothing in between there, right? So it's not that we come up and we get a fix and we say, okay, we're on track. So you have to do these, 
remarkably big distances and be very accurate when you show up. So this is a challenge and, and communications. Um, like during Apollo, a lot of the navigation uh, was done from the ground and the ground would send up uh, updated information to the Apollo guidance computer. Um, and if you had problems with communication, because radio communication is line of sight, which means that if your spacecraft is on the other side of the moon, then you can't talk to anybody. Or, or let's say something kind of goes wonky with communications, that's a problem, right? Um, and then there's gravity. You know, you don't really think of gravity as being a problem with navigation, but it turns out that if you're flying along through space and you come close to a big body, like you're, you know, you're you're flying by Mars, all of a sudden it's going to kind of grab you and pull you in. So you have to take that into account in terms of of managing trajectories. And so some of the things that we're kind of used to like pilotage and dead reckoning and having a compass heading and having charts aren't really as useful as uh, as we'd like them to be. You know, when we're on the earth, it's got a big uh, magnetic core and, and you could take your little compass out and, you know, that's a direction. Well, on the moon, uh, it has a very weak field. It doesn't, it has a crust, it doesn't have a core. And so compasses don't really work. And they also have thing called MASCONs. So they've got mass concentrations uh, of material that uh, change the amount of attraction associated with, with two bodies like a spacecraft and, and the moon. So we, we have, some, have some challenges there. So what I wanted to introduce you to, this is the uh, input-output device for the Apollo guidance computer. And um, you know it, it, it's become kind of um, uh, the thing to say that uh, you know, I have more uh, programming power or more more uh, memory or something in in my Apple Watch than than they had on the computer that went to the moon, um, and and for those individual kinds of things like how much memory, uh, I'm sure that's true, uh, but but this was a remarkable piece of engineering uh, at the time that this was being considered, which was in the late. 1950s and early 1960s, uh, a, a, a general pur purpose computer took up a room. It was room size and weighed several tons. So here, where every pound that you lift and you take to the moon requires a lot of fuel, you have to keep making the rocket bigger and bigger for every pound you want to lift. You couldn't lift something that was the size of a room and weighed several tons. So the challenge to Apollo was they said, okay, we want you to make a guidance and navigation computer that's gonna do things on uh, rendezvous and helping you land on the moon and all this kind of stuff. But we want it to fit into a space that is one, uh, one cubic feet in size and it weighs 50 pounds. And not only that, we want it to be something where it's going to be vibration proof, right? Because you can imagine, you know, if if you had a, a computer in a building and all of a sudden you had the building shake, you know, you could you could definitely hurt your computer. Or let's say that there were big changes in temperature or humidity or uh, or pressure or barometric pressure. Um, all of these kinds of things impact electronics. But you needed to make this thing bulletproof. I mean, so much so that not only would it operate if, uh, you know, seven and a half million pounds of thrust underneath it all of a sudden took off and this thing went to the moon, uh, but also uh, that it wouldn't get hung up uh, and you can't repair it in space, right? I mean, initially they were thinking, well, maybe we'll send up some tools and we'll send up some spare parts and we'll teach these guys how to like swap out boards and things like that. And they decided, you know what? This thing just has to be bulletproof. And so what they ended up doing is uh, they would take the computer, um, figure out all the, the, the wires, and, and, and then they would pot it. They, they'd put it in a resin so that um, the things wouldn't shake loose. And so this is the input-output device for the Apollo guidance computer. And the way in which they had the astronauts interact with the computer is... Uh, they would look at things and call them verbs and nouns. So a verb is do this, 
and a noun. Uh, well, a verb is this is what I want you to do, and the noun is I want you to do it to this. Okay, so a verb might be something like I want you to uh, display something on the computer, and the noun might be this is what I want you to display. So I want you to display what uh, what what the the closing speed between two spacecraft are. So the the verb might be display closing, you know, delta velocity or something like that. And you can see it only has a couple of buttons. And so the astronauts, um, they're all in their, their spacesuits and they got these big gloves on and stuff. So you can only just have a couple of buttons. And, um, and it was remarkably bulletproof. Uh, it was a, a wonderful, and, and even when it had problems, like it would have a program alarm or something like that, instead of locking up, what it would do is it would immediately reset itself. It would say, what's the most important thing for me to be doing? I'm going to do that. And if you've got some other request, I'm going to do that request in the background. And if I have enough bandwidth, I'll do it. And if I don't, it's just not going to happen. And uh, and so that's that's what this, uh, this input-output device is. And then these are the codes. So these are the different programs. So the first couple of ones, it, it's divided between the command module, where the, the three guys... Uh, we're in when they launched from from Florida, uh, and then the lunar module, and then there were some some other some other codes. So for the for the command module, uh, there would be stuff to to initialize it, and then things for navigation, and uh, when when the computer was supposed to fire the engines, different aborts and backups and things like that. And for the lunar module, so for example, when they're in orbit and they're ready to go and land on the moon, uh, they'd put in P63, which is program 63, which is the braking phase. And that orients the big bell engine underneath the, the lunar module uh, to, to be in the direction of flight. And they fire that engine for seven or eight minutes and it loses velocity and the lunar module you know, goes down to the surface of the, of the moon. So, Getting back to navigation and how we know where we where we are, um, if we don't have a map, if we don't have uh, fixed points that we're going to, like like we do on the surface of the Earth, uh, we have to come up with something else. And so this is ST one twenty four. This is the one hundred twenty fourth iteration of this inertial um, navigation system. And, and this particular one that we're looking at is part of a three foot high um, band that's sitting on top of the third stage of the, uh, of the Saturn V rocket. And this was built by uh, IBM. And what it consists of, these are, are accelerometers and, uh, and gyroscopes. And so what happens is you have a, a, a wheel and as something happens, like let's say that the rocket takes off, um, that imparts uh, motion into the angular motion into this wheel. So the wheel spins and, and in doing so, that gets converted into an electrical signal. And that signal goes to the inertial navigation system and says, okay, I'm being pushed in this direction by this amount of force for this amount of time. And the inertial navigation system says, okay, I'm going to remember that. And it, in addition to remembering that, remembering that we, you know, we went up for, for, you know, an hour and then we took a left for 20 minutes. Um, it also sends an electrical system back to the gyroscope and gives it a, an opposite direction torque. And what that does is it makes the platform stable. Okay. So, you got a stable platform, it gets angular momentum, it gets converted to an electrical signal, that signal gets recorded and it kind of keeps track. This is where I went. And so and so this is where I'm coming from. This is where I must be. And so it's this, it's this combination of these accelerometers that are sitting in this gyroscope and you've got this stable platform, but it's recording all of the different pushes that this, this spacecraft is... Uh, is having what what in in order to to 
get this inertial, inertial navigation system uh, aligned, uh, we, we need to know where we're starting from, right? I mean, if, if, if I told you that I knew all the lefts and rights and ups and downs that we did, but I couldn't tell you where we started from, you wouldn't be where you thought. You, you wouldn't know where you were, right? So you have to start by knowing where you are. So we have, um, you know, we've got one, dim one dimensional space, which is on a line and two dimensional space, which is on a plane and three dimensional space, which is you know, left, right, forward, back, up and down, right? We got three dimensions. So when we've got the rocket, so here's, here's launch pad 39A at the Cape. Uh, on the, on the y-axis, that's north and south. So you can, you can determine where you are on the planet and say, you know, between the North Pole and the South Pole, this is where launch pad 39A is. Now, east to west is the z-axis, and we can also determine that, right? We can say, how far away from, are we from Greenwich, England? And, and, you know, so with a latitude and longitude, and you can see it, it's got a couple different systems here, one called DMS, one is digital, you know, 28.608, uh, and, you know, geo references and all this sort of stuff. But it's all doing the same thing. It's, it's a plane on the earth, and it's saying that in these two dimensions, in the Z dimension and the Y dimension, I can tell you where on the planet I am. And, and the way they did that in the Saturn V is they had these two little pendulums that were located inside the navigation unit. And they're, these, they're weighted iron rods and they're floating on a pocket of air. And the earth is kind of rotating and the, the, the rods are being kept perfectly uh, flat. And so the gimbals are kind of telling the, the gyroscopes where you are. And so you're able to tell exactly where you are, east, west, and north and south. But here's the question, you know, that part is kind of like the, the, the latitude thing, you know, it's something that it wasn't all that tough to do. The question is, how do you do the X direction and why is that a thing? So the X thing is the direction up. So, and, and I, I wrote this here, I said, when, when the origin and the destination have different velocities, so when we're sitting on this globe, all right, um, and we think of we think of the Earth as, I mean, we know it's a it's a ball, but but when you look outside, it 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 looks you know it looks like a, a flat piece of paper. So when when we're on the Earth, the Earth is rotating at a speed of a thousand miles an hour, all right. And so if I look between here and a mile down the road. Um, it's not a problem because I'm moving at a thousand miles an hour. That place is moving at a thousand miles an hour. Anything on anything that we're talking about that's on the surface of the planet, not a problem. But what would happen if you picked a point instead of it being a point, you know, a mile east of us, but a mile uh, above us? All right. It's a problem because the Earth is spinning at a thousand miles an hour. And so now when I say I'm pointed at like a particular star or something, an hour from now, I'm not going to be pointed at that star, right? Every 24 hours, I'm, the, the earth turns all the way around. So what direction you're pointing is, is changing all the time, right? And it's really important, particularly if we're going to, you know, we're going to go to the moon. It's 338,000 miles away. Uh, it's real important that we know exactly where we are and that we're pointed in the right direction. So how do you do the x-axis? And that's, that's what I wanted to show you. So that we got, we got the, the z and we got the y, and, and let's talk a little bit about the x. So what they did was they, they designed uh, three prisms. So uh, two of these are being uh, shot and about 200 yards away from, uh, from the launch pad at, at 39A, they have a bunker. And they, it's a theatolite, uh, it's a, a laser. And they're sending this up to a little prism and it's called a Poro prism because in, uh, what it does is as you shine a light, you can see it up here, uh, you shine a light and it, it bounces around inside the prism and then it sends it back in the same direction, uh, in the direction that, that it came from. So here, this, uh, 
this bunker is shining this light at a 25 degree angle uh, up to a little sensor on the uh, on the Saturn V. And uh, so there are two prisms. So one is in, in this guidance unit, one is fixed and the other one is movable. So what they do is obviously as the earth is rotating, um, the uh, these two prisms are uh, are going to diverge, and and what they're able to do is tell the inertial navigation system um, to to line up these two prisms, have the, have the two lights uh, line up, and um, and they continuously do this for several hours before the rocket takes off. And then there's a third prism, and this one is pointed at. Uh, the surface of the Saturn V. And, and the reason that they do that uh, is not only is the Saturn V, you know, the Earth spinning at a thousand miles an hour, but um, the rocket, which is 365 feet tall, um, has a big sail area to it and there's wind and stuff. So the, the rocket is, is actually kind of swaying back and forth. And, and they say about 30 centimeters um, to either side of, of straight up. The, the the spacecraft is is kind of you know uh, moving around. So so between these three prisms, they're able to uh, to keep the x axis uh, in a place where they know where it is, and that's that turned out to be rather important. So I mean I remember as ten years old when Apollo eleven took off, and uh, I, I remember them saying. Uh, they, they get down to about 15 seconds and they say guidance is internal. And it's like, well, what the heck does that mean? Guidance is internal. So it turns out that uh, here's the, the timeline for Apollo 11. And uh, they're, they're starting the, the terminal countdown. And this starts at 28 hours, so about a day before um, they take off. Uh, and then they have this hold. Um, and then here you can see at 16.968 seconds, it says guidance reference release. And so what they're doing is up until this time, the theatolite is sending the laser signal uh, to continually update the, the rocket to say, this is way, where X is. And when they get down to a little under 17 seconds, um, they no longer do that. And the rocket is is saying, you know, this is where I'm at. I'm not taking any more information from the ground. And I was interested in the in that. And I, I couldn't quite figure out why it is that they do that. I mean, why wouldn't you just continue to take that information until the rocket takes off? You know, I mean, won't you get 17 seconds less error if you continue to, you know, to do that? So I reached out to uh to NASA. And one of the wonderful things about being a, a volunteer with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is when you have a question, when there's something that you don't understand, you can pose it to people and they they pass it around. And um, and they're just, they're wonderful. So the, the, the best guess that we have is that at about this time, at about 17 seconds uh, before the thing takes off, there are some things happening in the rocket that make it so it it doesn't really help you anymore to 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 be sending this guidance information. So bef about eight seconds, let's see. Um, so we have a command start on on the engine on the the Saturn one c engine at at about nine seconds prior to uh, to lift off. and and so that's nine seconds before the thing takes off. Well, before that, you have to spin up the turbo prompt. Pumps. So there's a great deal of vibration that's going on in this thing, and you know this this little laser light, uh, you know, is um, is the, the I, I would imagine the rocket's going to be moving a fair amount once once all these big turbo pumps uh, get going. So it's probably it's probably for that reason that they said when they got down to 17 seconds, they're like, okay, that's as much you know assistance as we can get from the ground in terms of of uh, uh, which way this thing is pointed. And so here you can see this is the instrumentation unit. It's about three feet tall and it goes all the way around. It's at the third stage of the of the Saturn V. Um, and here along the bottom, um, these are all the 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 different kinds of uh, pieces that are associated with it. But you can do updates um, when you're on the mission. So what we have here, is um, 
is kind of a, a sextant for space, right? So right here, these ocular pieces, the, the astronaut, this is in the lower equipment bay on the uh, uh, command module. He'll look through, through this and uh, align on a star and he'll say, okay, mark, you know, press a button and, and it'll say, okay, the, uh, uh, the sextant is looking at this particular star and they have maybe 30 reference stars. So the way this thing works is it has two controllers. One controller, uh, you're able to move the spacecraft if you need to move that around and the other moves the, the telescope. And so you, you, you move the spacecraft so that you can get the telescope to point at the star you want. And you can see over here on the right, that's one of those diskies. That's the, uh, the input output device for the uh, for computer. And you can see here on the bottom here, that's that's the computer right there. That's the Apollo guidance computer. Um, and not only do they have the ability to uh, this is this is kind of like doing re dead reckoning, right? You're coming up with with fixed points. Um, you can not only do it in the command module, you can also do it in the lun lunar module. So here. You can see the the lunar module. These things here are the are the armrests for for their uh, uh, for their elbows. And right here with that's that's ringed here in, in yellow. This is um, this is for sighting for their sextant, and and they can do the same thing. They can they can point the lunar module at a, a particular star, hit the mark button, and tell the computer, okay, this is these are the angles between this star and you know, on the horizon of the earth or, or, you know, here's the moon and here's the sun. And, uh, and, and that'll, uh, that'll help you with the navigation, to figure out where you're at. So in terms of navigating in space, we have a couple of things that we can do. One is inertial navigation, and that's using accelerometers and gyroscopes. Um, and then there's celestial navigation, right? You, you're taking angles off of known stars, and that helps you figure out where you're at. Uh, and then there's also using uh, laser light and um, and radio uh, frequencies, um, light and microwave uh, Doppler. So so if you if you were to bounce a signal off of uh, and, and you're not actually doing audio in space, I don't I, I don't want to give the impression because you can only do audio through um, you can't do audio through a vacuum. But but um, but a radio wave. Um, when you bounce a signal off of something, and then you bounce it again, and it takes more time or less time to get back to you, that tells you whether you're going towards it or away from it, and how quickly you're doing that. So that's that's the the essence of Doppler, right? I mean, when the when the um, the sound of uh, a whistle from a train. Uh, when when it becomes a higher or lower pitch, what what you're what you're hearing is um, is an expression of of uh, of what's happening. It's it's telling you that you're moving in a direction towards or away from. So uh, there are a number of different things that people are doing in order to navigate in space. And so just when we think about how in which uh, the way in which we get places so one dimensional space so we want to go from one place to another place well if you had a compass and you said okay it's that direction and you start walking it's one dimensional space that's all you need to know you just need to know it's 270 degrees so if you take a 270 degree heading you're there and then there's two dimensional space so we're on the surface of the earth and we've got a a, a map and we need to go, you know, up three streets and over one to the right and stuff. You could, you can um, uh, determine your position with with two dimensions. And now with three dimensions, like we're in an airplane, we not only want to know where are we in relation to the surface of the Earth, but also our elevation. So that's a three dimensional space. And we've gotten pretty good with with one dimensional space and two dimensional space and and navigating in three dimensional space right um but is that going to be the end of it and so i'm just going to throw out there that um maybe there's going to be more navigational requirements things that we can't do well right now 
So what if you had four dimensional space? So let's say, for example, I'm looking at this little cube, the small one, and, um, and, and these things that connect the little cube to the bigger cube, imagine that those are like arrows of time. Um, so it may just, it, it may be that not only do you need to know the, the left, uh, left, right, up, down, you know, having the, the, the three pieces of three dimensional space, but maybe there's also uh, a time element or something else. I mean, let's say we wanted to, uh, travel, um, through a wormhole or something like that. It might not simply be a question of coming up with one coordinate or two coordinates or three coordinates. There may be additional things that we have to learn in order to navigate. So that's all gonna be interesting. Um, and and that's, that's, all, that's all I got for you. So uh, questions and comments. So let's give David a big virtual round of applause for another great presentation. And as he said, if you have any comments or questions, uh, now is the time. Uh, try to get your questions into the Q&A and your comments into the chat so we keep things separate, but, you know, not the end of the world, uh, if you don't. Uh, so Suresh asks, uh, if we consider a spacecraft as being in a cube, positions always have three uh, points, I want to say, is this based from someplace on Earth? Well, um, don't don't get hung up on the spacecraft, uh, on the shape of the spacecraft, because in, in terms of dimensions, all right, when we, when we talk about being able to go from one place to another place, what, what you're asking is how many um, how many different values does it take for you to figure out how to get from one place to another? So when when you're not trying to get someplace, let's say you're you're sitting in your spacecraft, you are a single point. Okay, now that point can be a big point or a small point, or it could be a triangular shaped spacecraft or whatever. But but when we're talking about navigation, we're talking about you know what would it take for you to be able to get from where you want where you are to where you need to be. So if you wanted to go from where you are to someplace that you can see out in front of you. What it is is it's a line, right? It's a it's a line between the point that you're at and the point where you want to go. So that's a one dimensional. That's a line. But if you wanted to go someplace on the surface of the Earth, um, you know, you you uh, you might need to have, uh, you know, two different points. And if you're like flying in an airplane, you not only need the left and right and the north south, but you also need the the elevation. So um, yeah. Uh, Nancy is... says, wow, my mind is boggled. I have a oh. much better appreciation for all that goes into any type of navigation. Yeah. Uh, and she thanks you. Oh, yeah. I, this stuff boggles me, too. And, I, you know, I, I do these presentations not because I have a great deal of knowledge, because I'm I, my background is is not in science. I'm I, I'm a retired flight nurse. So um, and, and this picture of me uh, was taken at, at the Houston Space Center. And it was at their volunteer at their um, uh, visitor center. You know, I, I'm not an astronaut, never been an astronaut, but I like the picture. Um, but but, yeah. you know, when when we have these talks, it's because I think to myself, wow, how could you possibly do that? How could you how could you navigate in space when when things are all going at different speeds and there's no place there are no waypoints? And, and yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. Uh, DJ would like clarification. Uh, what is a gimbal? Yeah, so I was trying to I, I was trying to remember the the uh, I was looking up the 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 interrelationship between uh, gimbals and um, and and uh, gyroscopes. So a gyroscope uh, can have um, a number of gimbals, which um, How can I describe this? Because I, I remember reading that with Apollo, uh, they were trying to decide whether or not something should be a three gimbal or a four gimbal gyroscope. And uh, apparently, when you're when you're flying in an airplane, uh, if you have three gimbals, if you have, I, I think I think they're kind of like shells. Um, you you could you could only go in a um, there are only certain attitudes that are possible. 
Uh, and, and one of the things that they wanted to do was uh, they were talking about um, whether or not um, they needed a fourth gimbal. So, so my brother says that a gimbal is a mechanism uh, typically consisting of rings that pivot around at right angles that keep an instrument such as a, a chronometer or, or a compass uh, horizontal. Okay. Yeah, and, and interesting. Yeah, and, and so when they were uh, trying to decide whether or not they should have three gimbals or four gimbals, it turned out that uh, they went with the three ring thing because they said, you know, it's it's unlikely that we're going to end up having a problem. And when you see on like the, the movie Apollo 13 and they say, you know, we're floating near gimbal lock, um, it's actually possible in space to uh, to be going at an angle where uh, you end up messing the thing up and the, and the whole thing kind of locks up. Uh, but it's rare. And, and, and you know, so they kind of have that eight ball on, on their uh, uh, on their instrument panel and they and they have to to stay away from that. I know that was a long winded thing, but go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Teresa says this was absolutely fantastic. Such an exponentially complicated subject matter explained so everyone can understand the issues. Oh, great. Thank you very much, she says. Sure. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, from a PNT perspective, then this is all a precursor to GPS. There, are, uh, These are the elements which led to its discovery, question mark. Um, can, can they type in what, what, what uh, PNT? Sure. So anonymous um, attendee, if you want to clarify what PNT means, that'd be great. Yeah, or just, or just kind of come on. Um, yeah, so so with with global position, oh, position navigation and timing. Um, okay, yeah. So 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 just to to talk about uh, GPS for a moment. So um, using um, using these these hyper accurate clocks uh, that they have on these satellites and they have on the ground receivers, um, they're able to. Uh, and measuring the angles of of you know the the further away something is. So if you have a a, a satellite that's traveling and and it's ten feet away and you're measuring an angle, or it's miles away, hundreds of miles away, thousands of miles away, you know the the precision of uh, the angle uh, and the precision that they have with the timing uh, enables you to to be very very precise of where that satellite is. And when you have a receiver in your phone or you have it in your car or you have it in your spacecraft and you have three different uh, satellites or four or five, um, it it ends up it ends up triangulating and you're able to find out exactly where you are in relation to these hyper accurate uh, satellites. Uh, Kathleen says, thanks so much, David. This was so interesting. You are a great teacher. You took such a complex subject and allowed me to understand it. I loved this talk, she said. Oh, great. Great. Well, if you if you feel that way, then um, what I want to encourage people to do is to write, uh, uh, write to Robert and say, hey, invite him back. And I'd like to I'd like to hear about this, and and we'll we'll see whether or not there's there's any uh, um, agreement about you know what to talk about next. But there's there's all kinds of stuff related to uh, aviation and space that I think is really interesting, and 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 love to talk to you guys about it. Yeah, and to David's point, and and I don't mind folks sending me separate emails, but I also encourage you to fill out the feedback survey. And what, I believe it's the last question or second to last question. Uh, it does ask you for um, future, you know, topics and subjects, and I would encourage you to, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, write any topics or subjects related to space that you'd like David to talk about in the future. Uh, Bob asks, do solar flares interfere with navigation in space? Hmm. Um, well, that's interesting. Um, well, I mean, when we think of we think of solar flares. We we think about uh, you know a great deal of energy that's being um, emitted from the sun, um, and, and and we know that it it screws up um, uh, radio communications. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. 
That's okay. Uh, Frank says, bravo, breathtaking. The problem solving that went into the Apollo program alone is absolutely astounding. Oh, Thank yeah. you again. And uh, I will be watching this presentation, uh, the recording of this presentation. Great. And Rich, I think is going to wrap us up. Uh, wants to know, uh, were all the parts encased in resin to survive vibration? Well, yeah, so the, <clears throat> one, of, one of the issues uh, with this computer is you have all these little wires, um, and, and, and when they initially were, were doing the, uh, the computer for, for Apollo, um, this is just when they're, they're starting to, to, to use uh, transistors and, um, and you've got all these little wires that you have to solder into place. Um, well, so anytime that there's a wire that, that needs to be in contact with something, if you can encase that, then um, then solder isn't going to break loose, and and um, so as much of the wiring as as they could they could pot. They called it potting. Um, they would do that. Excellent. And uh, let me just confirm. Yep. So David, I think we've addressed all comments and questions. Do you have any last words for the audience before we wrap it up? Um, we. It's an exciting time in space. Um, I, I remember when I was growing up, I, I was just, I mean, the, the, the astronauts were my heroes and, and I, I loved space exploration. And then for the longest time, um, <clears throat> for 135 flights, we had the space shuttle and it just kind of went around the world, you know, and, and even the International Space Station, I mean, it's probably interesting science, um, but it doesn't capture my imagination, but <clears throat> the kinds of things that are happening now with, um, with Virgin Galactic and with Blue Origin and with Orbital Science and uh, ULA, um, the United Launch Alliance just launched on Monday and SpaceX and uh, all that stuff is just fascinating. You know, we're going back to the moon, um, very cool stuff. So uh, we'd love to meet with you again. As, as would we. So let's give David a, a final uh, virtual round of applause for a great presentation. Uh, folks who are watching live, I'll look for an email for me tomorrow with a link to the recording, a link to a feedback survey, information about some other upcoming virtual programs that might be of interest. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. And um, yeah. I, I'm still in mourning over Bill Belichick, David. So I'm I'm still I'm still processing things. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I I have have some some similar emotions. I figured that that Tom and Bill would just finish their careers in in Foxborough, and and uh, I don't know. I hope everybody has a a, a, a happy and and healthy 2024. Yes, yes. Let's 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 uh, have a great year. So thank you all so much, and uh, hopefully we see Dave, we see David again in a couple of months. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.